Yes, hello, good morning. This is for my friend Nikolai. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah. So it's filling up. Yeah. yeah. Two people. He can do it from there. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, everybody here in this beautiful plenary room. Dear colleagues, take your seats. We will start with our meeting. Welcome again to our first plenary session of this annual session. It's the 26th annual session. Um, and let me first thank uh, our hosts once again for the wonderful reception and the hospitality in general. Thank you very much. Uh, before we begin, can I ask anyone speaking from a prepared text to hand the text to the secretariat in advance, helping the interpreters in this way will make our meetings more productive and efficient. I would like to ask you first to adopt the agenda for this meeting which is circulated. This is the case, so the agenda is adopted. Before we start consideration of supplementary items, I would like to announce that Vice President Lord Bonus will chair the drafting committee which will prepare the Minsk Declaration. In order to help the flow of discussion and to avoid duplication, we will debate the two supplementary items on migration together. 
these are supplementary items number 14 and 15. We will, of course, vote separately on the supplementary items and the amendments proposed to them. I expect that we will start these votes at a quarter to ten, something like this. There are there is a total um, there are a total of seven speakers on the lists for this morning debates. In accordance with Rule 30 of our Rules of Procedure, in order to allow as many delegates to speak um, as possible, I have to decided to to limit the speeches in all the debates this morning to five minutes. Is this agreed? This is the case. Uh, the time limit, it's long, it's five minutes, but the time limit, limit will be strictly applied. I remind members that the list of speakers has been closed. Supplementary item number 14 is entitled for a coherent, shared and responsible governance of migration and refugee flows. Ten amendments have been tabled to the supplementary item. I call Mr. Lombardi to present the supplementary item. Mr. Lombardi. I'm here. You have, here you are, yes. <laughs> you have the floor. I'm close to you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. The other Committee on Migration in 15 months of activity was able to visit four countries having uh, important problems with the migration flow. It is France, Italy, Greece, and Turkey. Was able to meet all other international um, organizations and institutions working with this subject, being UNHCR, IOM, European Commission, EASA, and ICRC. The the result of this committee flows into the supplementary item. There is a report which is uh, uh, at your disposal. But the result, the proposals, the concrete proposals we want are uh, all um, included in the supplementary item number 14, which I'm presenting you for a coherent, shared, and responsible governance of migration and refugee flows. The other item of our colleague Neri, Vice President of the Committee, is also discussed today. It takes uh, over a couple of more of points which were of more interest for him. There is no contradiction between the two, the two items, and if you agree, we can uh, then adopt uh, both of them. Uh, they they complement each other, and they are not contradictory. Let's say that um, the uh, conclusions of our committee, the, intermediate conclusions are that, uh, first of all, the migration and refugee flows will not end, and this an illusion uh, of the media and probably part of the public opinion to think that now there are other problems and we can stop uh, dealing with the migration issue. There are terrorism uh, uh, questions all over the world, there are different uh, strategic political problems, and we tend to forget this because there was a warning, a strong warning two years ago, and now it seems to, to, to go back. I already uh, said in our standing committee in Vienna that the problem will come back this year very strong, and we are watching it in Italy, where this year we may uh, reach the absolute historical record of number of refugees on the one hand, but also of number of victims in the Mediterranean route. So we cannot stop uh, dealing with this issue. We have to increase our efforts also as OSCEPA uh, to, in order to uh, monitor what's happening and to give our governments a uh, number of inputs. And the, the major objective of this supplementary item, I think, is to support the, um, uh, the resolution, the, um, the decision which was taken by the Ministerial Committee in Hamburg last December. This was a first important step. OSCE at ministerial level decided a number of measures. It is now the case to implement them. And we want, with our supplementary item, support this process and even um, 
uh, increase the political pressure so that the governments do whatever uh, it's in their power to do. So you, you find all the different uh, um, considerations and recommendations. I, I'm not going to, 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 to read them because you have the text, but this is the main goal. An important discussion took also par, uh, place in our committee in how far can we just call upon moral responsibility and voluntary um, commitment of participating states in dealing with this question, or is it thinkable that one day, not tomorrow, but one day, we will reach a system like uh, the European Union did, where there are also binding legal obligations for the member states. This discussion is not solved yet, it's not closed. We will have it in the plenary because there will be uh, um, um, an amendment uh, draft coming from members of the committee itself. But this is probably the most uh, uh, controversial point, if you want, controversial in a positive way, because one can say it's important to have moral responsibility, and someone can say, okay, but we want also binding, binding uh, legal uh, obligations for the participating states. We know that the OSCE is not the frame in which these uh, procedures are uh, possible at the moment, we can always uh, speak for, for the future. There have been 10 amendments uh, to the um, draft uh, resolution. Let's say that uh, the committee met and uh, suggest you then to, we will discuss them separately, but we suggest you to accept eight of the 10, or seven, seven of the 10 which have been introduced. I will, I will then comment. Uh, we consider them as friendly amendments uh, useful to uh, improve the text and uh, certainly not to weaken it. So let's uh, maybe open the discussion on the, the general discussion and then we will see the single points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, as uh, we are going to discuss both of the uh, supplementary items, uh, I would uh, like now uh, to ask Mr. Neri to present uh, the supplementary item number 15. As uh, Mr. Lombardi had said, they um, are not contradictory, contra contradictory but uh, complementary. So, um, Mr. Neri, please, you have the floor. <coughs> Merci, Madame la Présidente. Mesdames et Messieurs les délégués, D'abord, bonjour à tous. Et puis vous dire que c'est avec beaucoup de plaisir que je présente ces points additionnels qui est complémentaire de ce que vient de présenter le président Lombardi. Lorsqu'il y a un an et demi, en février 2015, j'avais demandé au président Canerva de bien vouloir créer une commission ad hoc sur ce problème important des migrations. Il avait tout de suite donné son accord et nous avions mis en place une commission ad hoc. Cette commission ad hoc a beaucoup travaillé. Nous nous sommes déplacés, nous sommes allés sur le terrain, nous sommes allés à Calais, nous sommes allés en Sicile, nous sommes allés en Grèce, nous sommes allés en Turquie, nous avons rencontré des, des organisations internationales à Bruxelles, à Genève. Donc un véritable travail de fond a été réalisé. Aujourd'hui, nous en arrivons euh, pratiquement aux conclusions. Je dois dire que je partage grandement tout ce qui est écrit dans le rapport du président Lombardi et de la commission. Simplement, je voudrais dire que, pour ma part, je considère que nous devons abonder, affronter le problème des migrations en deux étapes. Il y a d'abord une étape, c'est l'urgence quotidienne qui est devant nous avec l'arrivée massive de migrants dans des conditions souvent épouvantables et avec beaucoup de morts lors du voyage suite au naufrage. Donc, je pense que l'urgence, c'est effectivement de trouver une solution pour stopper dans l'immédiat ces migrations qui sont une rente indécente, inacceptable pour les passeurs, pour ces réseaux de passeurs qui sont des voyous, des mafieux et des assassins au vu du nombre de victimes lors des traversées et dans les conditions où ils sont exploités parfois dans les camps. Il faut savoir que lorsque nous sommes allés à Calais, les autorités policières franco-britanniques nous ont dit, retenez bien le mot, je mets le terme entre guillemets, le chiffre d'affaires 
qui était en cause dans la jungle de Calais qui a été démantelée par le gouvernement français, c'était 3 milliards et demi d'euros. 3 milliards et demi d'euros de trafic. Donc c'est absolument épouvantable et insupportable. Ce trafic étant le trafic des êtres humains, femmes, hommes et enfants. Donc il nous faut absolument démanteler et éradiquer ces réseaux de passeurs. Et je demande à ce qu'il y ait une mobilisation des États. Et pour aider cette mobilisation des États, il faut une mobilisation de l'opinion publique. Et c'est aussi notre travail. Deuxièmement, à moyen terme, il faut se pencher sur le problème de comment arriver à trouver une solution pour ces migrations. Ces migrations, ce problème migratoire, a en réalité, je crois, quatre causes principales. La première, c'est une cause économique. La deuxième, il y a une cause qui est une cause politique et une cause de sécurité. Les gens souhaitent vivre en paix et dans la dignité chez eux. Et lorsqu'ils ne l'ont pas, ils essayent d'aller le trouver ailleurs. Troisièmement, il y a les problèmes d'environnement de, et de causes climatiques, en particulier avec le problème de l'eau. Lorsque, suite au dérangement climatique, il n'y aura plus d'eau dans certaines régions, donc plus de vie possible, il faudra bien comprendre que ces populations vont être amenées à se déplacer. Il faut donc lutter contre ces variations climatiques inacceptables aussi. Et c'est le travail qui a été mis en particulier avec la COP21 qui s'est réunie à Paris et les conclusions qui doivent être mises en œuvre par tous les pays. Et quatrièmement, je crois qu'il faut aussi se poser le problème, c'est le problème d'une véritable politique démographique. En effet, aujourd'hui, il faut savoir que l'Afrique, c'est 700 millions d'habitants. Dans 20 ans, ça sera 2 milliards. Donc je crois qu'il faudra aussi se poser le problème d'une véritable politique démographique raisonnable, raisonnée et dans la dignité. Alors, pour ce qui est le problème de, des migrants économiques, ben, je crois que la solution réside dans le fait que les États se mobilisent davantage dans des actions de développement. Et à la limite, ces actions de développement, qui vont coûter relativement cher, c'est vrai, mais lorsqu'on constate aujourd'hui l'argent qui est injecté dans des actions militaires pour apporter des solutions dans les pays où la vie n'est plus possible, par exemple en Syrie, où les interventions que la France mène en Libye, et en, pardon, au Mali, après avoir été effectivement en, en Afrique, dans d'autres pays, sont des sommes considérables qui pourraient être plus, plus facilement et plus honorablement et efficacement injectées dans des actions de développement. Pour ce qui concerne le problème de la sécurité, ben je crois que là aussi, il faut absolument se dire que on ne peut plus accepter que des, que des gens comme Daesh continuent par le terrorisme à mettre en péril la vie dans la dignité de certaines populations. Et je crois qu'il faut absolument qu'il y ait une mobilisation contre ce terrorisme, une mobilisation mondiale pour que on, effectivement, on éradique ce terrorisme insupportable. Insupportable. Troisièmement, pour ce qui concerne le climat, bien écoutez, il y a eu des décisions de prise à Paris sur la COP21. Il faut absolument une mobilisation des pays pour mettre en œuvre ces décisions pour que les gens puissent effectivement rester chez eux pour vivre avec des conditions climatiques qui leur permettent d'avoir l'eau indispensable. Et quatrièmement, la politique démographique, et j'en terminerai par là, 700 millions aujourd'hui, 2 milliards et demi dans 20 ans, il faut trouver une solution. Moi, je crois qu'aujourd'hui, en France, nous rendons hommage aujourd'hui à Simone Veil, qui a été une grande résistante, qui a également été, il ne faut pas l'oublier, celle qui a mis en place une véritable politique de contraception, qui permet une véritable politique démographique. Je crois qu'il faut absolument mettre en place une politique démographique. Et quand on parle de la liberté des femmes... C'est aussi défendre la liberté des femmes, de faire que ces femmes puissent avoir le choix de leur maternité et en même temps assurer une maternité qui permette faire des enfants, c'est bien, les élever dans la dignité, c'est mieux. Et c'est là où il faut avoir une véritable politique d'éducation en direction et des femmes et des familles. Je crois que c'est quatre directions sur lesquelles l'OSCE peut avoir un rôle déterminant qui doit nous mobiliser. Nous sommes certes pour prendre des décisions. Et je crois que le président Lombard a raison. Il faudra bien prendre des décisions, mais aussi nous devons être une force de proposition. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, dear colleagues, the debate is open. Um, you may speak on either supplementary item or on both of them. 
Uh, in the debate now, I call first uh, uh, Margareta Sederfeld from Sweden. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam <coughs> President. And I do also want uh, uh, to thank uh, Philippe Lombardi for his leadership of the committee. Uh, I have been a member of the committee. Uh, and I would like to mention one point that I see as very, very important when we are talking about uh, uh, the situation in the OSE region. First of all, we have our OSE com commitments, and there are also several perspectives of this. One is the human right. One is that we work together. And uh, when we are talking about refugees, it's very, very important that we stick to our OSCE commitments. And by this, I mean we should cooperate. We are talking about giving people shelter, people who need shelter. I know that there is a lot of, uh, uh, what should I say, the first countries is Italy, for example, it's Spain, it's Greece, where the people who seek shelter arrive. Then they seek further on. For example, to Sweden, to Germany, to Austria, and several other countries. What, there is a key point, and that's how should we share the responsibility? How can we give the best uh, possibilities for people to, who need shelter? I think when we talk about giving shelter, we should not say it should be voluntary. We have used the voluntary system in Europe. But there is a need for all countries to, to take part, to feel responsibility, to act responsibility. And that's why I support the supplementary items uh, and the, also the amendments that say delete voluntary. I say this because there is a need for shelter. There is a need for all countries who take part and act responsible. And what I also say, when it's a difficult time like this, then all our values are challenged. All our values, we could see this, because we have different, different uh, uh, points we, were, uh, we stress, but here we need to stand together. Thanks. Thank you very much. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Sergio Divina from Italy. Grazie, Presidente. Ah, eh, noi continuiamo a parlare di accoglienza, di umanità, di disponibilità. E sono parole che sulle quali ci troviamo tutti d'accordo, concordiamo tutti. Il problema è che poi si lasciano i problemi sempre in sospeso. In Italia sono arrivati lo scorso anno 200.000 persone. Anche il termine persone è meglio usare un termine generico, perché quando si parla di rifugiati creiamo grande confusione. Perché il rifugiato è una persona che scappa da una crisi, che scappa da una guerra, che ha un diritto internazionale ad essere accolto. Il 90% o forse più di queste persone tentano una via per cambiare il loro standard di vita. A livello europeo si sono realizzate più missioni, in parte umanitarie, l'ultima di queste finalmente per fermare quello che è un gravissimo problema a livello internazionale, cioè la tratta di esseri umani. Si è scoperto che esistono organizzazioni che reclutano persone nei posti da dove partono, organizzano viaggi via terra e poi organizzano l'ultima fase via mare, previo compenso, altissimi compensi. Sarebbe interessante capire anche come queste persone, che sono dei grandi disagiati, poverissimi, riescono a recuperare queste cifre importantissime per i loro paesi, quasi impossibile da accumulare. Sarebbe interessante capire come si organizzano, chi finanzia, se vi sono altre organizzazioni 
a monte di queste. Una volta realizzata, messo in campo l'operazione via mare, non ci si preoccupa più di ciò che accade quando queste persone vengono poi portate in qualche approdo. L'Italia non è più in grado di sopportare questo. Abbiamo sempre belle, interessanti parole di solidarietà da tutti i paesi dell'Europa. Salvo poi nessun paese farsi carico delle famose quote di redistribuzione. È un problema che ha lasciato per lo più all'Italia e alla Grecia, per quella parte di migrazioni diverse, da aree diverse, che non, che non dal nord, del Nord Africa. L'Austria addirittura minaccia di portare l'esercito sul Brennero per bloccare le frontiere. La Francia ha dichiarato, caro Neri, di chiudere i propri porti in alternativa a tutti i porti italiani. Così non va. Noi italiani ci sentiamo presi in giro. Nessuno di noi dice che non si debbano accogliere le persone che scappano da crisi, persone che fuggono dalle bombe, che fuggono dalle guerre. Ma dimostrarci noi, generosi, nei confronti di un'accoglienza generale dei famosi anche migranti economici, non farà altro che incentivare altre partenze di altre persone che creeranno problemi, problemi su problemi. Io chiedo ai presentatori e a tutta l'Assemblea di farsi carico veramente, non a parole, perché l'Italia ha avuto tanta solidarietà a parole, ma di farsi carico veramente di un problema che è un problema globale, perché il vento non si può fermare con le mani e qua nessuno riesce a fermare questo grande vento che sta arrivando. Grazie. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Ms. Uh, Hedy Fry, please, from Canada. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. And I, I wanted to thank um, uh, Mr. Lombardi. I am on the committee, and he has done a great deal of work. And Farima, of course, has been the wizard behind trying to get this report together. So I also want to thank her. And I, but I think that, and I, I want to thank um, Mr. Lombardi and the committee for also understanding that women are specifically at risk, women and children, and for putting this into his report and to bringing it into his supplementary item. I also think that Mr. Neri made some very important points about how to deal with this in the long term. The problem of migrants is not going to go away. It isn't just people fleeing war. It is because of climate change. There is drought in many countries, and people can't feed themselves and their children. They have to leave. They have to find a way. You, all of us know that we have families, and that if our families are at risk because we can't feed them, we watch our children die. We want to go. We want to leave. We want to go somewhere where we can afford to give them some kind of decent life. So, so poverty is another issue. So we cannot, uh, uh, Mr. Neri and Mr. Lombardi's Uh, items come together and mesh nicely. Because if we don't pay attention to our aid, our foreign aid in terms of helping countries to feed themselves, to get rid of poverty, to get good health care, to be able to find a way to stay home and be able to build lives for themselves, no one wants to root up and go to another part of the world where you are not welcome, where you may or may not find shelter, where you are wandering around with your children in even more danger than when they were in the original country. So this is a real problem, and I think that Mr. Lombardi talked a lot, and, and, and Madam Sederfeld talked a lot about how it isn't good enough to talk about voluntary anymore. We are either all in this together, and we all are prepared to do our bit to help the countries like Greece and, and Italy that are facing uh, this influx of people and have no way to help them and have no way to do anything. I mean, there's also an issue of security in this, in this position. If you have organized crime preying on families that are wandering around Europe with nowhere to go, then we are actually going to have a security problem because organized crime is winning on this one. And the second bit about that, too, is that if you have people who are homeless, uh, who do not have access to food and health care and education for their children, then what you have are people wandering around Europe who are going to rise up one day because they're not going to be content. 
to have watch their children die and to have no shelter or roof over their heads or access to health care or access to education. We are going to see this as a real problem. It is in everyone's best interest to do this together. To say you will voluntarily do it or you will close your borders doesn't make any sense. In Canada, we have a history of immigrants, of migrants as we call them, and of refugees coming to our shores. We are, our whole country is built with migrants and our whole country is built with people from another part of the world who came there, some of them to make a better life, some of them fleeing the First World War, the Second World War, the Hungarian Revolution, all of the revolutions that occurred in Europe. People have come to Canada and we have seen a net benefit in all of these people who came. They built a nation and they have been a strength for us as a country. And so it isn't a negative thing. Of course we have to be concerned about terrorism and of course we need to come together and talk about how we pick people, we have to have databases, we have to know who are people at risk and who are people that are not, who are people that we consider risky for our own security and who are people who are not. But the only way to do this is for all of us to work together to make that happen. There's only one answer to this problem. And I think we said that very clearly at the meeting yesterday. Um, Mr. Lombardi heard, um, heard us uh, two days ago talking about the fact that we no longer can talk about, please will you help? We can no longer say, will you volunteer to do this? We can no longer say, you're going to close your borders. And many times in, this, in Europe and, and in the rest of the world, we've seen wars that have caused people to flee, and people have found homes, and they've found a place to live. Let us work together. Let us stop talking about being voluntary. Let everyone decide that if we're not in this together, all of us are going to be harmed. And it's not only that Italy and Greece need help, but all of the countries in the OSCE are going to face problems if we don't work together to deal with this problem now and to work, as Mr. Neri said, to preventing it from continuing to happen in the long term. And so we need to deal with the issues that, are, that cause people to want to leave. And so I really feel that it's, this is such an important issue. It's probably the single most important issue. Um, we know that, that Ukraine and others have issues, but this is the most important issue we're facing as, as, a, as countries, as OSCE, and as a global problem. We've seen the United Nations have talked about this. And, and in Canada, we even have a system for refugees. We brought in a lot of Syrian refugees last year. And it is the government supports them, but we also have churches and little towns and villages and families who are putting money together to take a family and to help them through and to help them to go to school and to bring them into the country. We're waiting. We have people in Canada waiting to do this as private sponsors. So I think this is an important way to look at how we work together, learn best practices, and move together on this solidly and no longer talk about volunteerism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. The next speaker is uh, Ms. Marietta Tidei from Italy. Grazie, Presidente. Ci tengo anch'io ad associarmi ai ringraziamenti al Presidente Lombardi per come ha condotto il lavoro della Commissione in questo anno e anche per la, la grande attività che ha svolto. Sono state ricordate le missioni sul campo e anche tante discussioni, tante riunioni che a volte ci hanno visto in qualche modo non dico su fronti contrapposti ma sicuramente con opinioni diverse prima veniva ricordato appunto la, la volontarietà del, dell'aiuto comunque io eh, noi, noi parliamo oggi mentre eh, tra poche ore diciamo sarà in corso a Tallinn il, un incontro tra i ministri degli interni e guardate eh, su una cosa insomma mi sento di anche dar ragione a chi mi ha preceduto la solidarietà, il tempo della solidarietà a parole deve finire e farei solamente due o tre semplicissime considerazioni. Eh, noi sappiamo che il 97% di coloro che arrivano in Italia in questo momento, perché arrivano tutti in Italia per la verità, arrivano dalla Libia. Quindi è chiaro che non si può non partire dalla stabilizzazione di quel paese, so di dire una cosa molto ambiziosa, difficile, però sappiamo quanto in quel paese i trafficanti di morte facciano affari e quindi è chiaro che lì prima di tutto bisogna agire congiuntamente perché finché non si stabilizzerà quel paese io credo che comunque continueremo a vedere questo fenomeno eh, con una produzione di effetti devastanti. E la lotta ai trafficanti, lo diceva prima anche all'NRI mi sembra che comunque dovrebbe essere qualcosa di assolutamente prioritario perché noi sappiamo tutti che comunque i trafficanti con regimi fragili come quelli 
come quello libico sicuramente fanno affari d'oro. Mi preme però sottolineare anche una sproporzione enorme che c'è tra quanto è stato investito, tra quanto è stato fatto sulla rotta balcanica e tra quanto invece a mio avviso non si sta facendo nel Mediterraneo centrale. E questo credo che sia vergognoso, lo voglio dire con parole anche molto forti, perché per frenare il flusso sulla rotta balcanica l'Europa, l'Unione Europea si è attivata attraverso un accordo con la Turchia che comunque sta dando dei frutti perché di fatto quella rotta ormai non vede più migranti o comunque ne vede molto pochi e è incomprensibile che comunque non in qualche modo si faccia, so che la Libia non è la Turchia e quindi no, non voglio dire che va fatto un accordo in questo senso perché dicevo prima che la Libia non è un paese stabile ma sicuramente ci deve essere un investimento maggiore in quel paese e c'è a mio avviso bisogno anche di un impegno diretto anche economico da parte degli stati membri perché Probabilmente le risorse che ha messo a disposizione l'Unione Europea, così come quelle che sta mettendo a disposizione, non sono sufficienti. E guardate, il nostro sistema di accoglienza in questo momento è messo assolutamente a dura prova. Eh, seppure stiamo facendo molto e stiamo facendo, secondo me, anche abbastanza bene. Per esempio abbiamo un accordo con l'Associazione Nazionale dei Comuni Italiani perché crediamo che chiaramente un sistema di accoglienza diffusa sia un sistema che faciliti l'integrazione ma che soprattutto la renda più sostenibile alle comunità eh, locali. Però credo che sia incomprensibile, e voglio usare una parola forte, che ci sia una missione internazionale di salvataggio ma che l'accoglienza sia lasciata a un solo paese in questo momento. C'era prima la Grecia, quindi voglio dire so che altri paesi hanno comunque avuto gli stessi problemi, però credo che sia ipocrita pensare di salvare senza accogliere, così credo che sia giusto, visto che ormai il 34% dei salvataggi viene fatto dalle navi delle ONG, che guardate io voglio ringraziare perché io credo che svolgano nel Mediterraneo un lavoro pregevole, prezioso, perché salvano vite umane, però penso anche che ci sia bisogno, lo diceva ieri il nostro ministro, durante un'informativa alla Camera dei Deputati ci sia bisogno comunque di un codice di regolamentazione, di una collaborazione maggiore con la Guardia Costiera Libica e soprattutto mi rivolgo ai colleghi, so che non stiamo nella sede dell'Unione Europea, non stiamo al Parlamento Europeo, però guardate, io credo che proprio da questa assemblea parlamentare e i parlamentari dovrebbero forse vedere un po' più lontano, dovrebbero fungere anche un po' da stimolo anche nei confronti dei loro governi. È tempo di rispettare gli impegni. Noi abbiamo preso degli impegni sulla relocation che non sono stati mantenuti minimamente. Sono anni che parliamo della revisione del regolamento di Dublino che era figlio di un altro tempo e ancora non l'abbiamo fatto. Abbiamo visto invece i muri, i fili spinati e guardate il sistema volontario, mi trovo assolutamente d'accordo con quell'emendamento che presenteremo, non funziona perché purtroppo per anni ci siamo basati su sistemi volontari, ma abbiamo visto che è un meccanismo che è inefficiente, che non basta, quindi serve qualcosa di più. Allora, parliamo di numeri alti, perché parliamo di numeri alti, ma io credo che l'Europa sia in grado di gestire questi numeri. L'abbiamo ricord ricordato tante volte, l'85% di coloro che si muovono in maniera forzata non vengono in Europa, vanno nei paesi più poveri, quindi sono numeri che l'Europa può gestire, ma può gestirli soprattutto se comunque decide di gestirli in maniera, di, di, secondo un principio di responsabilità condivisa e non pensando di voltarsi dall'altra parte, scaricando il problema una volta a un paese, una volta ad un altro, perché questa cosa non funziona più. Guardate, ieri il ministro Minniti, sempre alla Camera, diceva una cosa, L'accoglienza ha un limite, questo limite è nella capacità di integrazione. Eh, purtroppo paesi come il mio, e lo dico a malincuore, voi sapete tutti che tengo molto a questo tema, questo limite purtroppo lo stanno superando. Allora, siccome invece crediamo che l'immigrazione possa costituire anche una fonte di ricchezza, di sviluppo per un paese, però dobbiamo tutti quanti, non solo a parole, Dio ad operarci Marietta. perché comunque questo avvenga. Grazie. Thank you very much. I, we really have to stick to the time. I know it's a very emotional topic and we really need time for it, but um, still we have to stick to the five minutes. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Sheila Jackson-Lee from the United States. Thank you, Madam President, um, and to my commissioners. It is a pleasure to be here with the U.S. delegation. Let me thank Mr. Lombardi and his committee. We had an opportunity to speak earlier this morning on the extreme and very uh, important hard work that has been done by the committee in the United States. I serve on the Immigration Committee and have really been dealing with these issues for 
uh, more than uh, 20 years, more years than I would like to uh, acknowledge, and I have seen uh, the trends. Let me first of all say that as a little girl and most Americans, we have gone to the Statute of Liberty understanding the underpinnings of our nation, which is that we welcome all people. And I would argue and suggest to my friends here that even with changes that you've heard, the bulk of the American people understand the importance of immigrants and the fact that our nation was built upon the outstanding leadership and contributions of immigrants and those who have migrated to the United States. In fact, uh, we argue and support uh, the concepts of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, who offered to us of the beloved community that we love people and recognize the importance of their differences. I want to thank Mr. Lombardi for this enormously thoughtful uh, resolution that commits itself to the New York Declaration in 2016 that says that uh, we resolve that the international community has to save lives, protect rights, and share responsibility at global scale on this question of migration and refugees. Uh, having just come from uh, Greece, we understand the concerns, and I would say to my colleagues, none of us should make light of the challenges and the um, responses that have come from those who have accepted, uh, those who are fleeing from persecution. I want to thank Mr. Neary as well because he spoke about the indefensible acts of the smugglers and of course uh, made sure that the question of uh, our refugees who are fleeing uh, are not discriminated against uh, because of race, religion, and nationality and that we should not return them to devastating conditions uh, nor should we ignore the fundamental right of asylum. And I totally agree as we fight uh, to insist that the asylum process in the United States is improved and that we recognize that there are individuals who need asylum. Uh, to Mr. Lombardi, I thank you for co-sponsoring uh, my amendments number five and eight, in particular dealing with the vulnerability of women and girls. Uh, we recognize uh, the importance of uh, effectively identifying and assisting victims of human trafficking. And then uh, the amendment number eight, I chair in the United States, the Congressional Children's Caucus, and uh, the plight of children is devastating, and I'm very grateful to the amendment uh, that indicates that children coming in should be screened. Let me be very clear that according to the International Labor Organization, more than 20 million people are enslaved, but in particular, the National Center for missing and exploited children say that a child trafficked victim living on the street, uh, 14 years old, may not live until or past the age of 21. I would make the argument uh, that uh, the idea of protecting women and children, or women and girls and children, can save thousands of lives, because in the course of human trafficking, we can fully expect that thousands will die that have been trafficked. So this is important work, uh, colleagues, that we're doing today. Uh, humorously, I said that uh, we may be doing more important work uh, than, of course, the G20. I'm sure there will be many that will argue against that. But this work dealing with migration, Mr. Lombardi, Mr. Neri, I am very grateful to be part of it, and I thank you very much for allowing uh, this opportunity uh, to offer my thanks and also my comments on an important historical and world item that universally, not single countries, but universally, we should be supporting and helping. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is Ms. Susanna Amador from Portugal. Good morning. Thank you, Madam the President. The World Refugee Day was marked on 20 June. This was yet another opportunity for all of us to remember this overwhelming reality that is affecting more and more people around the world and has become absolutely dramatic. Almost 65 million are displaced and forced to flee from home. According with the latest data from UNHCR, reported in June 2017, there are 20, 22 and a half million refugees in the world, with about half of them being under the age of 18. So they are children asking also for our protection. In each pacing minute, an average of 20 people are forced 
to flee because of conflict or persecution. In this context, Europe, too, has been challenged in recent years by unique historical circumstances, the intensification of conflicts and new wars, the response to an extraordinary influx of refugees who are crossing in a dis desperate way the Mediterranean Sea in search of their survival and a new horizon of life, taking unimaginable risks. Only in 2016, more than 40,000 people, refugees and migrants, lost their lives. Lots of them were children also, causing what we can be considered a humanitarian calamity. In order to face a time of massive displacement and unprecedented humanitarian crisis, we need, as you, as you have talking right there in this morning, joint and effective action to find durable solutions for refugees and to prevent root causes. We need political initiative at European and international level. We need also efficient mechanisms, not on a voluntary basis. In addition to the universal definition of a refugee inserted in the Geneva Convention, a further definition of refugee is important, embracing humanitarian reasons as it goes it by climate change that prevents sometimes access to basic and essential rights and to life itself. All of them need different levels of protection, but they all need protection and also our solidarity. This uh, does and we need a renewed global commitment to tolerance and protection for people fleeing from serious environmental problems, conflicts and persecutions, overcoming and overthrowing xenophobic and fundamentalist prejudice and all of the walls and barriers that still feed them. Within the framework of responsibilities within the European Union, Portugal has shown an exemplary commitment and willingness to welcome and integrate refugees, fully affirming its humanist and humanitarian values with transversal support throughout Portuguese society. The latest figures for 2017 show that our country, as part of the European Union's refugee resettlement program, was able to promote the integration of 2,000 refugees, involving 92 counties across the country and covering 10 different nationalities. For us, receiving people is also a source of economic growth. All of them, more than enough, are already, are already working, and demographic vitality, we need it. We need it in Europe, and we need it in Portugal, which is the fourth oldest country in Europe. So, for conclude, the OSHA must therefore continue to reiterate its unconditional commitment to the protection of refugees in the narrow sense, and the defense of human rights in the name of peace and fraternity among all people of the world. Peace is actually the new name of development. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Mr. Christopher Smith from the United thank States. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. First of all, I want to thank Mr. Lombardi and Mr. Neary for their resolutions. I think they're excellent. I especially want to draw attention to uh, Mr. Lombardi's focusing on the alarm that we all must feel towards the vulnerable children who are vulnerable to trafficking, unaccompanied minors. Uh, it is a serious ongoing threat to children, and I thank him for including that as part of his resolution. Madam Chair, over the last three years, I've actually chaired, as chairman of the Helsinki Commission and chairman of the Human Rights Committee of the Foreign Affairs Committee, nine comprehensive hearings on the refugee crisis in the Middle East. Well, we've looked at it from every possible way. The United States, I'm happy to say, is the major donor providing about approximately $8 billion since 2012 uh, to assisting refugees through the UNHCR and through other mechanisms. But at one of our hearings uh, a couple of years ago, we learned from the UNHCR itself that the proximate cause for the massive migration, and it was agreed to by all of our witnesses, including the Assistant Secretary for Population and Refugees and Migration, the top official in the US government, that the proximate cause for everyone upstaking and leaving was gross underfunding by the international community uh, to UNHCR appeals for food, clothing, shelter, uh, and medicines, as well as educational opportunities. The trigger, they said, uh, was the 30% cut in the world food program. So all of a sudden, refugees and IDPs are facing a very, very difficult choice, shelter in place, 
and not have adequate resources to feed their families or vote with their feet and try to find a better place somewhere else. I would also point out that a month ago, I was actually in South Sudan, in Juba, went to several refugee camps and IDP camps in that region. And again, the underfunding issue, uh, again, asserts itself. People are getting rationing uh, and living on far less than what is required uh, to be even modestly healthy. This morning, I would like to bring attention to the fact that the Christians in Erbil have been bypassed. I was in Erbil last Christmas and for three years was trying to get my own government to come up with resources for them because the normal channels have not worked for the Christians. There were about 70,000 uh, in that region from the Nineveh Plain and Mo Mosul. And frankly, if it wasn't for private charities like the Knights of Columbus and a few others, they wouldn't have a dime in order to feed, clothe, and shelter uh, their IDPs. I introduced legislation, it's bipartisan legislation, that passed the House of Representatives on June 16th that puts us on record and will provide adequate funding, we hope, uh, to these people, these children especially, uh, who are not getting the food and, like I said, medicine and shelter that they so richly deserve. I bring this to the attention of all of my colleagues, asking that when you go back to your respective capitals, to see if you can help. I want to thank the Hungarians. I'd like to thank Poland for stepping up to the plate and providing humanitarian assistance to these Christians who have been bypassed. The Archbishop Werda, the Chaldean Archbishop there, uh, I've been with him, I've had his top people testify. Uh, they are in a food insecurity crisis right now. And if they don't get humanitarian assistance, we'll see sicker children, sicker women and men, and, and families who could be doing far better. Finally, our legislation uh, is very much focused on the issue of not just humanitarian stabilization, but also on the next steps, recovery, and how to, to provide a durable so solution, whether it be uh, as an asylum seeker uh, in the United States or elsewhere, or going back if it is safe and secure enough. So again, these resolutions are great. I thank you for them. And I do ask my colleagues to really check out how we might better help. I mean, all refugees need help. A refugee is a refugee is a refugee. But the Christian refugees in Erbil have been left out. They should not be left behind any longer. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear colleagues. Um, uh, there are, we have three additional speakers. Um, and I think we will allow them to speak but I ask you to limit yourself to three minutes. So the next speaker is Lord Stubbs from the UK. Uh, th thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I'm a member of the Migration Committee, uh, and I'd like to pay my tribute to the chair, uh, Filippo Lombardi, and particularly to Farima, who's done a fantastic job in making sense of our many deliberations and making us seem a very coherent and logical group of people. I also very much welcome many contributions made this morning, including the one by Heidi Fry and by Marietta Tidley. Now, um, I don't think we can step aside and watch Italy bear the burden. Italy is having a very difficult time, I agree with that, and we just cannot sit there and say, well, you've got to solve it. We've got to step in and help. I think the situation in Libya is desperately difficult. Unless we can find a way of helping in Libya to stabilize the country, the flow of migrants will continue. And they'll all come, the most of them will, will come to Italy. And we've got to redouble our efforts to see whether we can deal with all the key players in Italy, not just those that govern one, one part of the country. Uh, unlike um, um, normal OSC tradition, I'm actually very critical of my own government. Uh, normally people don't criticize their own government. I've been very critical of the British government, and I shall go on, I shall go on being critical. I've been critical in the British Parliament, and I don't mind repeating some of that here. Uh, I think we have to look particularly at the plight of children among the refugee thousands in, in Europe. Uh, we have to look both at the Dublin Free Convention and make it work. There are many children in European countries who have members of their family in other European countries. Surely we should overcome the bureaucratic difficulties and get those children reunited with their families. They have the right to be reunited, and we have to push in our own countries to do that. And I've been blaming the British government for not doing nearly enough about that. I do believe we need to make sure that we keep on distinguishing 
between asylum seekers under the 51 Convention and immigrants. There's nothing wrong with being an economic migrant, but in human rights terms, I think we have to give priority to those that have a well-founded fear of persecution, war, f fleeing from torture, and so on. If we can do that, we might begin to make some sense of the difficulties we're in. I think we have to make sure that we keep public opinion on our side. I felt that in the UK, public opinion was supportive of efforts to help and bring more child refugees into the country, and I think public opinion helped to influence government members of parliament in, in the right direction. However, uh, the government is still being very difficult in London, and, and um, I'm not saying the OSCE can help me with that, but we'll have to battle in London ourselves to get, to get us back to sensible policies about taking more child, child refugees. I'd just like to say two other things very quickly. One is I agree entirely with the need to share responsibility across Europe. Frankly, it comes to something when Germany has become the conscience of Europe, and, uh, and, uh, along, with Sweden, uh, along with Sweden, and other countries have to do better, inc including Britain. I just finished by saying this. I was standing in front of Parliament. A young Syrian man um, was standing in front of Parliament, he a refugee, a, a child, and he said, you know what my ambition is? My ambition is to become a member of Parliament. Now, that may, or may not, that may or may not be a great idea, but I do, think, I do think that these people, these refugees coming here, will, with our help, make a positive contribution to our countries and our societies. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Dubs. Next speaker is from Ukraine, uh, is a Mr. Shufrich. The floor is yours. And three minutes, as we agreed. Thank you. Господин председатель, слушаю, уважаемые коллеги. Безусловно, проблема, которая сегодня была поднята в проекте резолюции, подготовленной господином Ломбарди, очень актуальна. Я с глубоким сожалением отмечаю, что в вопросах, которые касаются беженцев, мы не увидели, мы не увидели проблемы, связанные с порядка более чем одним миллионом беженцев и переселенцев, которые вынуждены были покинуть свои родные дома вследствие эскалации конфликта на Донбассе и вследствие донбасского кризиса. Безусловно, я очень благодарен господину Нари, который обратил внимание на факты торговли людьми, и мы сегодня имеем, к сожалению, печальное подтверждение этим фактам. В Российской Федерации была ликвидирована банда, которая торговала людьми, которые надеялись на лучшую жизнь, уезжая из Донбасса, и такие факты у нас имеются в других странах европейского континента. Безусловно, с этим надо бороться. Мы должны помнить, что это происходит не где-нибудь, а в центре Европы. И я хочу сегодня выразить особую благодарность белорусскому руководству, находясь в Минске, за то, что была предоставлена площадка, которая вселяет надежду на урегулирование донецкого и донбасского кризиса, и я рад, что такая площадка есть, и мы сегодня находимся в городе, который предоставляет возможность для переговоров для всех сторон конфликта. Три года назад я имел честь быть приобщенным к организации первой встречи контактной группы 23-27 июня в городе Донецке. Тогда действовало первое перемирие, количество погибших было 74 человека. 30 июня решением президента Украины Украина вышла односторонне из режима перемирия и перешла в наступление. Последствия мы знаем. Шестикратное обнищание людей. Десятки тысяч погибших, точное количество погибших никто не знает. Это цена одного решения. И в итоге в феврале 2015 года мы вернулись к переговорам. Но в разрушенной экономике с обневчавшим народом сегодня более половины украинцев находится за чертой бедности. Эта власть никогда не реализует Минские соглашения, потому что им мир не нужен. Причины на то три. Первое. Боятся ответственности за принятое три года назад решение, вследствие которого погибли десятки тысяч людей и разрушена экономика страны. Люди обнищали в шесть раз. Подчеркиваю, это статистика международная. Второе. Сегодня очень удобно спекулировать на войне, потому что людям можно говорить, вы живете плохо, потому что в стране война, а то, что эта власть, в том числе и причина этой войны, об этом умалчивается. И третье. Три миллиона человек сегодня получит право голосовать, если реинтегрируется Донбасский регион в Украину, если восстановится украинская юрисдикция в этом регионе. 
а власть этого не хочет и боится. И объясните мне, почему сегодня платятся премиальные за военные действия в условиях перемирия? Я считаю, что сегодня власть всячески стимулирует противостояние. К сожалению, время мое исчерпано. Я хочу только выразить надежду здесь, в Минске, что Минск таки будет реализован, и поблагодарить активность уже и Соединенных Штатов, и их желание подключиться к этому процессу. Может быть, все вместе, украинская власть убедят реализовать Минские соглашения, обеспечить мир на Донбассе и стабильность в Европе. Спасибо. Mr. Chair, first of all, I would like to thank for uh, both of you uh, for uh, very excellent draft uh, resolutions, and I believe that they match really nicely also together. I would like to focus today uh, to also mention that there are very good examples uh, how to integrate asylum seekers and uh, migrants in our societies, and we should, as a society, benefit of such a work different states have been doing. As the pressure increases on, on those countries receiving huge amount of asylum seekers and uh, refugees, this situation actually risks undermining European Uh, political solidarity and the efforts to respond to the human, humanitarian needs migrants and the refugees actually need. I believe that uh, a lot of uh, countries have uh, enormous challenges which have caused the situation that the public opinion uh, can even turn to, re to rejection and fear And this is one of the big challenges when we talk about the migration, that we could uh, uh, fight against attitudes and fight against uh, such a challenges where even politically uh, such issues are used as an everyday political um, material. On the other hand, I must uh, underline that many countries have enormous efforts done already to integrate migrants and they have taken their challenges uh, seriously. I must also say that many of these approaches to integration of migrants can challenge us to do things differently. We should uh, more underline the good practices which can be broadly used to succeed also within the coming challenges. Many examples actually show that um, in the integration of the migrants is one of the big uh, challenge which we are facing. If we can integrate uh, newcomers better, I think we all can benefit. It should be everyone's best interest that the integration should be done a lot better than we're doing now. So I think this part should be focused even more in the coming discussions of our work. Thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, so the debate is closed on this item and now we will start voting procedures But before, before that, uh, of course, I would like to ask Mr. Lombardi uh, or Mr. Narit or to respond shortly, maybe a minute or two, to the, to the uh, contributions here. Thank you very much, President. Thank to all participants in the discussion for the new inputs, the additional inputs they, give, they gave to our um, uh, work. We will proceed after the... Uh, meeting here in Minsk, we will proceed in the committee with uh, uh, our work. I would also like to thank, many people um, have thanked the committee and the chair, but I would like to thank the 21 members from 17 different countries and our uh, secretary, Farima Daftari, for the very good cooperation which made possible this report and this supplementary item. Please don't forget that although having 40 paragraphs, the supplementary items 
cannot deal with all the aspects of uh, uh, this very complex problem. There is the report, and in the, in the report you find more, and for instance, the problem of uh, IDP, internally displaced person, which was quoted by some um, speakers this morning, is uh, of course outlined in the report, although not having specific paragraphs uh, here. The issue is ongoing. We know that the international community has, first of all, to attack the causes of these refugee flows, because you won't stop the refugee flows and you won't be able to give an appropriate answer to those who flow who, who, uh, if you don't solve the, ca the causes of uh, these uh, uh, problems, which are the wars, of course, the instability and collapse of states, the terrorism, the violation of human rights, the climate change, the uh, demographic and uh, economic policies of uh, a number of countries, and, of course, the big, the huge economic interest represented by trafficking. And trafficking is really one of the problems. In that sense, I totally agree with our Vice President uh, Alain Nery that trafficking is on the top of the priorities to be, uh, to be uh, attacked. Um, we shall, it is the understanding of the committee, we shall keep in the future a distinction Although being willing to deal with all the problems, we shall keep the distinctions between refugees with legal status according to international conventions and migrants who also have their rights, but a different uh, level of, uh, of rights. We shall notice that the European Union uh, has a big responsibility. We are here in the OSCE, but we know the European Union has means legal and financial means to deal with a number of these problems. And the European Union is willing but not yet able to reform this uh, regulation of Dublin, which is uh, not working anymore under the present conditions. And of course, that member states are uh, requested then to participate, to fulfill their objectives in the uh, in the quota, in the relocation uh, scheme. There are big differences we could uh, notice in the countries we visited. And I want to underline the important role of Turkey in uh, uh, all the uh, uh, in fulfilling with its commitments, not only with the European Union, but also with the basic rights of migrants they uh, have on their country. We will continue supporting the governmental activity and stimulating, I would like to say, the governmental activity of our participating states in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Filippo, uh, and uh, once again, thank you for your very important work. Now, uh, we will start voting on supplementary item 14, uh, paragraph by paragraph, uh, uh, and of course, on the amendments which have been tabled. I'd like to remind you that under uh, rule of 22 of our procedures, rules and procedures, the only members uh, who may speak are uh, the mover of the amendment or uh, another member who is in favor uh, and, of course, one member uh, uh, who is opposed. And uh, who's, who's, who opposed. And, uh, of course, a principal sponsor. And in case, is Mr. Lombardi. So we like to ask you to limit your speeches in favor or opposing to one minute. And I think we agree on that, uh, to take into consideration our time constraints. Now, we will vote on paragraph first and second of the supplementary item. Any objections? Are we agreed? So we now come to the amendment number one to add a new paragraph after paragraph two. And I call Ms. Moore to move the amendment. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a very straightforward amendment. Um, to recognize that many people who are perceived to be migrants or refugees uh, who have malintent when they are not. And just because a person wears a headscarf or is a person of color does not mean uh, that they find themselves subject to uh, xenophobic attacks and discrimination. Uh, this amendment asks uh, the OCE 
uh, region to redouble our efforts to protect civil liberties and fundamental rights, even in the face of security challenges such as terrorism, um, and to affirmatively uh, denounce hate. As parliamentarians, we can play a leadership role in promoting inclusive visions for our society, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, does anyone wish to speak uh, against the amendment? There's a one, please. Grazie, Presidente. Ma io suggerirei di non accogliere questo emendamento perché oltre che per inciso mi sembra ridondante ed evoca una tematica come processo alle intenzioni. Approfitto anche dell'occasione per raccogliere i molti spunti della discussione generale che sono venuti dai colleghi americani e dalla collega canadese. C'è una differenza di fondo fra quelle che furono le emigrazioni che negli Stati Uniti e in Canada portarono più integrazione e quindi una costruzione della coscienza nazionale attraverso le emigrazioni. Qui nel Mediterraneo il caso è del tutto diverso, più sono le emigrazioni e più difficile, più precaria è la integrazione. Anzi, noi assistiamo a fenomeni di autentica disintegrazione sollevati proprio dai sentimenti che la collega vorrebbe esorcizzare con questo emendamento. Io direi che non è opportuno far riferimento a questo inciso perché è l'ulteriore maniera con la quale noi eludiamo che cosa c'è dietro queste emigrazioni. Dietro queste emigrazioni c'è il fallimento della istituzione Stato nazionale in Medio Oriente. Io ho molte speranze sul futuro della Siria, persino della Libia, eccetera, ma non mi illudo che questa possa portarci su una via come quella del Canada o degli Stati Uniti d'America. Di qui la inopportunità di questo inciso. Grazie, mi scuso Presidente. Thank you. Uh, does Mr. Lombardi wish to respond, to comment? Please. Thank you, President. The committee discussed this uh, amendment yesterday and is willing to accept it as a friendly amendment improving the text. Nota bene, for my Italian colleague and friend, this is not a recommendation. It is part of the considerations we make, and we may recognize that we are also alarmed by the xenophobic attacks. It's not a recommendation. It's part of the considerations we make at the beginning. In that sense, the committee accepts the amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Now we will directly go for voting. Uh, and uh, amendment number one, who is in favor? Please raise your hands. Thank you. And who is against? Abstentions? Just a guess, was it five? Against or but it, it was a big majority, yes. and then so it's 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 passed, it's uh, uh, agreed. Now we will vote on paragraph three to ten of the supplementary item. And please, any objections? Again, paragraph three to ten. Yeah, whole seven. There's a no objection, so it's agreed. So we now come to amendment number two. Uh, to re no, the number two to replace paragraph eleven with two new paragraphs. I call Mr. Haldgren to move the amendment. Uh, Dean Owls here from CAD. I'm going to uh, make that amendment on his behalf. So I, I want to revise paragraph 11 as following, including this division into separate paragraphs, underlining the crucial importance of dismantling migrant smuggling and human trafficking networks in order to re redirect migrants and refugees to safe and orderly flows and to prevent further deaths 
and human suffering. And then the second paragraph would be reaffirming OSC commitments to fighting human trafficking and migrant and refugee flows in this area, in particular the OSC action plan to combat trafficking in human beings, and it's in its 213 addendum, and commanding, uh, commending the efforts of the special representative and coordinator for combating trafficking in human beings to be developed action-oriented recommendations to be better prevent and respond to human trafficking, including in migrant and refugee flows. And I just, just want to talk and I want to thank Mr. Lombardi once again for his hard work on the supplementary item and focusing on the much needed attention on this uh, challenging facing migrants and refugees entering the OSC region. And migrants and refugees are certainly vulnerable due to smuggling and vulnerability can lead to human trafficking, but smuggling and trafficking are not the same thing. Smuggling is about transportation, trafficking is about expo exploitation. And so we've spent nearly 20 years educating policymakers, police, prosecutors, judges, social welfare agencies, and communities to recognize in human, human trafficking. And human trafficking doesn't require the movement across the border, but it does require commercial exploitation akin to slavery. Sometimes it's foreigners who are being trafficked, but in many countries, most people traffic some of their own citizens. And so I just want to uh, finish off with we do trafficking victims no favor by confusing slavery with illegal entry into a country, and my amendment to paragraph 11 ensures that the parliamentary assembly recognizes the difference. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone wish to speak against this amendment? Nobody? So, is Mr. Lombardi is okay? He's Committee agrees. Accepting? So it's agreed. Uh, now we'll vote on amendment number two. Or we, we adopted it. We adopted it. Now we'll go to. Okay, so we'll now vote on paragraph 12 to 14 of the supplementary item. Any objections? No, it's, it's agreed. Uh, now, amendment number three to add a new paragraph after paragraph 14. And again, I'd like to call Ms. Moore for to, to, to uh, you know, introduce this amendment, to move it. Please. And, and thank you so much. This is a very straightforward amendment uh, expressing support for smart security policies uh, that denounce xenophobia in all its forms. Of course, we are concerned uh, about security measures and terrorism, but I'll give you a couple of examples that I have found very distressing in my own country. Um, just literally days ago, the Afghani girls who ha wanted to compete in a robotics contest were denied visas to the United States. I mean, that is, is a, a foolish uh, uh, security measure. And of course, the uh, Muslim ban, um, which has been denounced by the United States court system, is another example of a security measure that does nothing except promote uh, xenophobia uh, and does not particularly ensure uh, any greater uh, security for our country. I would ask uh, the members to adopt this amendment. And I yield. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And uh, does anyone uh, want to speak uh, against this amendment? No. Committee. Yes, committee, I mean, and, and the initiator agreed. So it's, it's uh, done, agreed. We will now vote uh, on amendment number three, or we just we just voted. Yeah. So it's amendment number four to add another new paragraph after paragraph 14. And again, as Ms. Moore, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, two years ago, I introduced language in the Helsinki Declaration adopted by this body calling for OSCE to, um, to act to address heightened racism and xenophobia in the region and ethnic profiling in addition to supporting inclusion um, efforts. Um, this amendment just builds upon that and it protects civil liberties and fundamental rights even in the face of our security challenges such as terrorism. And we should also support efforts such as ODIR's groundbreaking, uh, turning words into action, anti-Semitic project and urge the adoption of similar racism and xenophobia initiatives for other vulnerable ethnic and religious communities. That includes, um, thank you, I yield back. Thank you, does uh, anyone want to uh, speak against the amendments? 
No. Mr. Lombardi. Yeah, it's in favor. It's agreed. Okay, now paragraph 15 to 19. We have to vote uh, from 15 to 19 for the supplementary item. Any objections? 15 to 19. No objections, agreed. And amendment number five to add a new subparagraph in paragraph 20. And I call Ms. Lee to move the amendment. Please, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much um, to my uh, fellow commissioners and uh, delighted of uh, Ms. Moore's passage and Mr. Lombardi's uh, support and co-sponsorship of my amendment that deals with the vulnerable women and children. Uh, I particularly appreciate paragraph 20, which stresses the importance of gender mainstreaming and enduring the mi that migration policies take into account the particular vulnerabilities facing women and girls uh, and uh, migrants and refugees, as well as the different experiences of men, um, of men and women and boys and girls. Uh, my amendment in particular would call for effective measures to identify and assist victims of human trafficking it is well known that according to the International Labor Organization, more than 20 million people enslaved, more than half women and girls, most into sex slavery. Thousands may die from HIV, homicide, and torture, but the screening for human trafficking is vital to save lives. I ask my colleagues to support the amendment. Well, thank you very much. Uh, anyone against? No. Mr. Lombardi? So in favor, Mr. Lombardi is in favor, so it's agreed. Thank you. So now paragraph 20 on supplementary of the supplementary item as amended. Paragraph 20 as amended. Does anybody no, we have to vote for this? Yeah. No. It's it's agreed, yeah. It's, it's no objections on that. Now amendment number six to amend paragraph 21 and call Mr. Varaminos to move the agreement. Please, one minute for that. Thank you, Chair. I think that uh, many members of the committee coming from the countries far away for the front line of the problems uh, had the chance to understand the problem deeply. Taking into consideration this uh, background, I think that uh, we are talking not uh, only for moral uh, obligations, but we are referring in the legal obligations. We have the international law, we have the international agreements, and the commitments coming for these agreements. Uh, in this uh, respect, I think that uh, we have to delete the word moral uh, for this reason. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Anyone against uh, the, this, this amendment? If it's not the case, oh, okay. Mr. Lombardi, please. Thank you, President. Uh, the committee discussed yesterday Amendment 6, as well as Amendment 7, also from colleague Varemenos, who want to delete the following word voluntarily. The position of the committee mm. is that we accept the Amendment 7, so delete the word voluntarily, but we do not accept Amendment 6 to delete the word moral. Why? Because if we delete moral, we, uh, we would uh, intend that there are legal, legally binding obligations. This is the case for the European Union uh, relocation uh, um, uh, agreement. There, uh, European Union forces legally binding obligations. Okay, uh, we, we can add the word uh, legal. At the legal. Sorry, please. We think. Moral at the legal. We, we think uh, uh, that uh, we shall keep the moral obligation because this is what we, we are aiming and striving to have in future, maybe also a legally binding obligation. At the moment, it is a moral obligation, but we agree with Amendment 7 of Mr. Varemenos to delete the word voluntarily. It is. To a moral obligation to relocate or resettle the uh, numbers of persons. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then we will vote for this amendment. Uh, we are voting for the amendment number seven. Who is in favor? Uh, but, six. Uh, sorry. I'm sorry, six. It's, it's six, yeah. Can I? Uh, who is in favor? Amendment Can number I six. Have a... 
Please, please hold your hands for a minute. Hold them up very high. Hold them up. I'm not asking to, to vote uh, for that, but just to show. Sorry. Just a sec. Ali. Could maybe it's uh... no, no, no. We could we can't open discussion no, no. here no, just at this moment. But if you need second. more clarification, that would yes about that that it was. So accepted. we vote. We have voted now about uh, over Amendment Six, and it was, I guess, well clarified by initiator and also Mr. Lombardi. So what the question is, okay. Okay, then uh, now who is against? Abstentions? Just one, two, three. Yeah, what is it? Oh, no. There are more abstentions there, okay? Where are yeah, what's the result? What the figure is? 55, Okay. So, result is uh, 24. Uh, 24 votes uh, in favor, 53 against, and 15 abstentions. So it's not agreed. Uh, amendment number seven, and I'd like to ask you to be very short because we have a really time constraint. And again, uh, I think it's a Mr. Verminus, please. Amendment number seven. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, we propose the deletion of the word uh, voluntary as it does not comply with the spirit and the letter of the above decision establishing measures in the area of international protection for the benefit of it, uh, Italy and Greece. I think that uh, voluntary is complete abstract expression. Thank you very much. Now we go for vote. Uh, yeah, but. Anyone against? Uh, there's a one. Please, yes, Mr. Uh, we uh, we would like we will vote no, against. No, no, no. There was. The, I'm very sorry, but it was. Oh, sorry. The Dobesova. I'm very sorry. Please. Thank you for the floor. I would like to express our opinion against uh, of deleting this uh, word uh, voluntarily because uh, I think that help and solidarity is something which we can't uh, say or press that it is compulsory. Solidarity has a lot of dimensions, not only quotas or relocation mechanism. And uh, for example, Czech Republic uh, helps uh, uh, to solve migration crisis with different ways, uh, like help with medical care, with, uh, with uh, financial support. And uh, uh, compulsory relocation is something which we can't accept. So I would be very glad and kindly ask you to support my opinion that uh, quotas or relocation can't be compa uh, uh, compulsory, that it uh, is voluntarily, be, want to, want to, want to, uh, sorry, I forgot the word. No, we, we understood that, yeah, it's clear. You. So, uh, Mr. Lombardi and then we'll Thank you, us. after having 
rejected Amendment 6, I repeat that the committee would agree with Amendment 7. Just, yeah, we have to have to vote. Who is in favor? Please raise your hands. Okay, uh, those against? I mean, it's, it's very clear. It's clear. Oh, I think it's, it's, it's clear, the picture, so it's passed, it's agreed. And now uh, we have to vote on paragraph 21 of the supplementary item as amended. Yeah. Any objections? No objections, so. It passed and agreed. Uh, we now come to amendment number uh, paragraph 22 to 24 of the supplementary item. Any objections for the paragraphs 22 to 24? No, it's agreed to. Now amendment 8, number 8, to amend paragraph 25. And again, Call Mrs. Lee to move the amendment. Again, again uh, good morning, and I thank Mr. Lombardi for co sponsoring the amendment. Uh, I personally have been at the border uh, between the United States and Mexico and seen the influx of unaccompanied children, uh, so literally seeing uh, little ones get off uh, the bus out of fear of their life. Um, but many have not come that way, they've come through smugglers. And so we've found when unaccompanied minors come to the United States, many children have been trafficked along the way. As I indicated earlier, a child traffic victim living on the street at the age of 14 may not make it past their 21st birthday. UNICEF estimates that 26,000 children crossed the Mediterranean last year. Many, if not most, of these children passed through Libya, the main migrant route, and tragically they have not been able to protect migrant children. These children may be ashamed of what happened to them, but they may be trafficked uh, and may be afraid to disclose to law enforcement and border guards that they are trafficking victims. They need special care, emotional, physical, psychological care in every way to recover, not to be vulnerable. And so my language in, uh, amends to include screening for instances of human trafficking. Again, I ask for support to save the lives of these children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so who is against? Is anybody against of this amendment? Committee no, committee agrees, so... Non, ah, okay. non ce n'est pas un amendement contre, simplement je voulais faire remarquer à l'Assemblée que nous avons l'opération européenne SOFIA et qu'elle est complètement impuissante parce qu'à cause du droit international, elle est obligée de s'arrêter à la limite des eaux territoriales. Ce qui fait que s'il n'y avait pas cet amendement-là, si on employait la, la, le droit d'ingérence de Kouchner, cette opération SOFIA pourrait arrêter le trafic des passeurs en Libye, en vous rappelant que c'est 38% du PIB de la, de la Libye actuellement, c'est beaucoup plus que le pétrole, c'est les passeurs. Je suis pour l'amendement, hein. j'ai un peu triché, mais je suis pour l'amendement. So, Mr. Lombardi, you are in favor of amendment, okay, so... We also agree. Well, then it's, uh, then it's passed, so thank you. It's adopted, and now it will be amendment. Uh, it's a paragraph 25 of the supplementary item as amended. Is anybody against of this? No, it's not this case, and it's agreed. Now we come to amendment in the paragraph 26 to 30 of the supplementary item. Any objections? 26 to 30. No objections. Thank you very much. It's agreed. Now, uh, amendment number nine to amendment to amend paragraph 31. And uh, again, Mr. Varaminos, please. Yes, uh, sir. This is according to the mandate of Frontex. And uh, we would like to ask for the deletion of the word uh, patrolling and its replacement by the more appropriate word surveillance, which is false, with the mandate of the said organization. Is according to the Frontex. 
Thank you very much. Anybody against uh, this amendment or this proposal? No. Uh, Mr. Lombardi agrees, so it's agreed to, adopted. Uh, uh, now it's amendment number nine, which we already, just, just a second, which we already adopted. Now we'll vote for paragraph 31 of the supplementary item as amended. Paragraph 31. Any objections, dear colleagues? No. Very good. So, adopted. Uh, now, paragraph 32 to 39. 32 to 39 of the supplementary item. Any objections? No objections. Mr. Lombardi, you agree? No. Adopted. Now, amendment number 10 to amend paragraph 40. And uh, Mr. Haldgren, please. Um, okay, Mr. Allison. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. And it, uh, just uh, really, would we go to uh, number C uh, in uh, paragraph 40? Just uh, it's establishing a high level and just striking out coordinator position and putting in task force on migration and then including that would meet quarterly uh, and be supported by the network. So th the point really is just we need dialogue and frequent conversation. Uh, meetings could be by video conference and I think that uh, this is important that we already, uh, we have representatives already in existing offices so we could uh, probably have them play a greater role in something like this. So that is the, uh, that's the recommendation I have. Thank you very much. Anybody's against? No, Mr. Lombardi, what's your opinion? We have no recommendation. No recommendation, good, adopted. And now vote on paragraph 40 of the supplementary item as amended. Is anybody against? No. Agreed. And uh, now we will uh, uh, vote for the supplementary item as a whole document. And before that, maybe you'd like to speak because we're running out of time. No, no, I, I'm just thankful for the very fruitful discussion, for the amendments which are helping us, and uh, as I said, we will continue on the same way. Thank you very much. So, for thank you very much. Uh, so, it's uh, supplementary item number 14. We agree on the supplementary item. Who's in favor? Okay, overwhelming majority. Was uh, against? Nobody is against abstention. No, no, nobody is against abstention. The just uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, okay, there's a little bit more. Eight, nine, ten. Well, supplementary item is agreed. Uh, so thank you very much again. And dear colleagues, we have maybe another uh, another five minutes, and I think we will go. Straightforward to, to supplementary item number 15, and after that we'll have coffee break. I'm very sorry because we, we, we need to complete our work. So uh, supplementary item number 15, initiated by Mr. Neri, and uh, let's 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 start. So uh, what on paragraph first to third of the supplementary item? First to third. Any objections? I'll give you maybe a few seconds to, to look in the papers and... Okay, one to three. No objections. Agreed. Uh, now it's amendment uh, number one to add the new paragraph after paragraph three. Mr. Kafka, Kafka Kalias. Please, I'm sorry, my friend. Thank you very much. Kafkalis. We deem important that the paragraph, uh, paragraph be included in the preambular part of the resolution, which points at the main reasons why a comprehensive and effective response proportionate uh, to the magnitude of the greatest uh, human tragedy since World War II is still uh, lacking. In this regard, particular measure is due to front line states which pay the price of the lack of sufficient will, solidarity and unity among states and their selective interpretation of what uh, global and indivisible security stands for. Thank you. Thank you. 
Does anybody want to speak against the amendment? No, Mr. Lobar, Mr. Neri. No, it's okay. Then, uh, then it's adopted. It passed. Thank you. Now we will vote uh, uh, on amendment number one. That's okay. Four to twelve. So vote on paragraph four to twelve on the supplementary item. Any objections? Paragraphs four to twelve. There are no objections. Well, we have no other. Yeah, yeah, just about no other amendment. So no other amendment. Now we will vote for the supplementary item as a whole, as a whole document. Who is in favor? And the same, I think, overwhelming. But thank you very much. Who is against? Nobody is against. Abstentions. Okay. Supplementary item number 15 is agreed. So thank you very much, Mr. Nari. And uh, so uh, we are closing now the session. Thank you very much for your hard work and uh, everybody who spoke. Uh, we will resume on Saturday on 8th of July at 15 at 3 o'clock uh, to hear reports uh, by the OAC. PA Special Representative on Gender Issue, uh, Ms. Heidi Fry, and uh, we will also consider supplementary item number four on promoting gender inclusive and responsive mediation proposed by Ms. Fry. Thank you very much.